Alrighty. So IFRS 9, financial instruments. How do we classify whether an investment will go to FVPL, FVOCI, or amortized cost? Put in your handout. Again, the handouts are, uh, the link for the handouts for the question copy can be found in the description below. You can download it. Number one, enter business model. And number two, enter contractual cash flows or contractual cash flow characteristics of the financial asset. All right. So for the business model, the FBOCI classification will be our choice of classification if the business model is sold to collect and sell. This means that initially, we are meant to collect cash flows, but then sometime in the far future, we will sell our investment. While for amortized cost, we will classify an investment as amortized cost if our business model is sold to collect. How about their cash flows? Their cash flows should solely be payments of principal and interest. Up top, also enter that by default, debt instruments are classified as amortized costs. Why is that? Because debt instruments, such as investment in bonds, have a maturity date. So, we are holding them to maturity or holding them to collect cash flows until maturity. That's the usual setup for debt instruments. So if one of these condition fails, if business model fails or cash flow fails, this will be, our investment will be classified as FVPL. And we can also put in here that by default, equity instruments except when we have exercised the irrevocable election concept, which we will discuss later on. Equity instruments by default are classified as FVPL. But if it is through irrevocable election, we have exercised that, we will say that it will be classified as FVOC. Once again, this concept will be discussed later on. Okay. And there are two exceptions. So number one exception is that if the business model or cash flow cash flow classification fails then this will be classified as fvpl right so if an equi an equity investment an example of which is we own shares of other companies right so equity investments that are classified as fvpl the exception is we can make the irrevocable election to classify such investment as FVOCI. The second exception is that if your investment is qualified for FVOCI or your investment is quali qualified for it to be classified as amortized cost, we can make the irrevocable election to classify it as FVPL. And there are two important I's to remember regarding these exceptions. The first one is they should be made and they can only be classified in another direction at initial recognition. And second, based on those terms there, once we elected it to classify in another classification, it is irrevocable. It cannot be changed or reverted back to another classification at a later date. Let's continue discussing these theories. So regarding the initial measurement of FVPL and FVOCI and amortized costs, for FVPL, put their fair value. For FVOCI and amortized costs, they're the same. Fair value plus the transaction cost. The transaction costs are the costs that we incurred because we acquired such investment. Under FVOCI and amortized costs, the transaction costs are capitalized. It's part of our investment. While for FVPL, the transaction costs are classified as expense. They are expensed immediately. So regarding their subsequent measurement, for both FVPL and FVOCI, they will be measured based on their names, fair value at year end.
However, for amortized costs, it's not based on fair value. It's based on their amortization table. So let's just put in amortized. So don't worry, we will have a lot of examples regarding these concepts later on so that we can show you or we can see how they are applied. Next one is changes in fair value. So every year end, for fair value profit or loss, we recognize an unrealized gain or loss. And it will be classified as profit or loss. For FBOCI, the changes in fair value will be classified as unrealized gain or loss, but they will not be part of our income statement. They will be placed right after the net income line and classified as other comprehensive income. While for amortized costs, fair value changes are ignored. Kindly put in also under FVPL. The effect of that unrealized gain or loss, if we have a gain, the fair value increased, right? So the effect of that is our net income will go up. Therefore, our retained earnings will also go up. Let's mark that in red. While for FVOCI, since they are placed in OCI, the other comprehensive income will go up and there will be a corresponding accumulated OCI, which will also go up. And that can be found in the equity section of our balance sheet. Take note that the unrealized gain OCI will not, will not increase your retained earnings. It will be placed on another equity account called accumulated OCI. Now, how do we classify the amortization of premium or discount? For FVPL, there is no amortization. To put it simply, our face value, which is the initial cost, multiplied by the percentage, the interest rate, is equal to interest income. So it's pretty straightforward. While for FBOCI, we will follow the amortization of premium or discount through the effective interest rate method. Lastly, for amortized costs, we have three methods. We either have a straight line method, a bond outstanding method, or an effective interest rate method. So in our example later on, we will focus on the effective interest rate method, the preparation of amortization table. Now, regarding the gain or loss on sale of investment, for FVPL, the selling price minus the carrying amount would be recognized as the gain or loss on sale. And this will be part of our income statement. So the journal entry would be debit cash. If it's sold at a gain, we will credit the gain on sale. And we will also credit financial asset at fair value profit or loss. So take note once again that the carrying amount is our fair value at the latest year end. So for example, we have a fair value on December 31, 2021, and we have sold our asset this year, in any day of this year. So the, 20, the selling price minus the fair value last year, December 31, 2021, would be our gain or loss on sale. And also, there would be a same treatment whether it's based on our classification a while ago. So FVPL by mandatory. This means one of the business model or cash flow requirements fail. So they are classified as FVPL by default or they are qualified as FVOCI or amortized costs. And we made exception number two, the irrevocable election to classify them as FVPL. To put it simply, no matter how you recognize the FVPL, as long as it is FVPL, there would be a gain or loss on sale. 
Now, there would be a difference in treatment, however, when we talk about our FVOCI. So FVOCI, if it is based on mandatory, this means that the cash flow and the business model requirements to be classified it as FVOCI are met. Step one, update carrying amount to fair value. And that fair value on the date of sale is equal to the selling price. And we would recognize the difference as, again, part of our unrealized gain or loss, OCI. Step two would be to recognize the sale. So debit cash and then credit financial asset at FVOCI. And step three would be to de-recognize our unrealized gain, accumulated balance. Debit, unrealized gain, OCI, and credit, gain on investment. And this gain will be regarded and be part of our income statement. And that is the most important line here. We will credit the gain on investment for the total of Selling price minus the initial cost or the acquisition cost from the very beginning. So take note that what you are debiting in the step three is not just the unrealized gain or loss that you recognize on the year of sale, but it is the total unrealized gain or loss over the years. So your selling price minus the initial cost when way, way back when you acquired the particular investment. That would be your gain on investment. And that is for FVOCI mandatory. And just to have a recap, this is our FVOCI mandatory if it fits the business model and the cash flows. There would be a difference in treatment for step three if it is FVOCI but through irrevocable election. That is exception number one. By default, it should have been FVPL, but we made the irrevocable election to classify it as FVOCI. Let's see how it is different. So if our FVOCI is not mandatory, but rather via irrevocable election. Let's zoom in quite a bit and defer it from <clears throat> the other FVOCI classification. So we will still have the same steps number one and number two. We will still update our carrying amount to the fair value and we will debit cash and credit financial asset at FVOCI. For step three, however, since this is made through irrevocable election, we will debit the unrealized gain OCI, but we will close the total unrealized gain over the years. We will credit retained earnings. Once again, if FVOCI is via irrevocable election, the accumulated OCI is close to retained earnings, not income statement. So that's how it differs. Once again, if you sold an FVOCI and you have classified it as FVOCI mandatory, it qualified the business model and cash flows, the entire, the cumulative unrealized gain would be close to gain on investment. But if you have sold an FVOCI that was made through irrevocable election, it should have been FVPL, but we elected for it to be FVOCI. When we sell our investment, we would debit unrealized gain OCI and close it off. Instead of a gain, take note, it is closed off to retained earnings. Very important to differentiate the two. Lastly, for amortized cost, step one would be to update the carrying amount to amortized cost on the day of sale. Step two, now that, you know, now that you have updated your carrying amount, the selling price 
minus the updated carrying amount from step one would be recognized as gain or loss on sale. And this will be classified in our income statement also. So the journal entry would be debit cash if it is sold again, credit gain on sale and credit investment in bonds. And take note that since this is amortized cost, the business model is hold to collect. You often really do not sell, right? Because that's not your intention. The Investment in amortized cost rarely encounters sale transaction because their original intention is this amortized cost is classified as such because we are meant to hold them until maturity. And once again, the carrying amount here would be our amortized cost on the date of sale. So that's it. It's quite a lot of concepts there. You can pause the video if you want to have a recap for this. And lastly, how would we treat when we sell our investment? How would we treat our unrealized gain or losses? We would treat them as for FVPL, since our unrealized gain or loss for FVPL has no accumulated balance since they are recognized in income statement every year and closed off to retain earnings, there is no issue here. No issue. Once again, unrealized gain or loss for FVPL is always closed at every year. On the other hand, for FVOCI mandatory, your total or accumulated OCI will be transferred to profit or loss. And once again, what would be the effect in our net income? Since this will be, if we have a gain and this will be transferred to our net income, net income will go up, RE will go up. But since we are transferring from one equity account, accumulated OCI, to another equity account, retained earnings, it won't have any effect on our total equity. Right? Imagine the entry, debit, unrealized gain or loss, OCI, credit our income or gain on investment. So that gain on investment will go to retained earnings. It won't have an effect in the total equity. Right? It's just a transfer from one equity account to another. That's very tricky. So Make sure to understand that before moving forward. On the other hand, if our FVOCI is classified through irrevocable election, from accumulated unrealized gain or lost OCI, it will be a direct transfer to retain earnings. As such, net income won't go up, right? Net income will have no effect. How about retained earnings? Since you will transfer from one equity account and then now you will enter it into retained earnings, our retained earnings will go up, but our total equity will still have no effect. Once again, we deducted our equity because we debited accumulated OCI, but then we added back the equity through retained earnings. So net effect for total equity is zero. And lastly, for amortized costs, since in the first place, the fair value changes are ignored for amortized costs, there's also no issue here. No issue. Fair value changes are ignored. And that's it for our concepts for classifying FVPL, FVOCI, or amortized costs. Now, let's go to our example and see how they're accounted for differently. 